My name is John Nelson. I work for a mapping software company named ESRI, Esri, and I'm on a team there called Living Atlas. Living Atlas is a lot of fun for me, and I think everybody else on the team. It's a little bit like an ecosystem of the global mapping community. There's a demographer, there's uh, environmental scientists, there's an oceanographer, there's uh, one of everything, it seems like, on this little microcosm of the mapping world. And it's great. It's so much fun. And what I do there is create user experiences. So I'll design applications um, by waving my hands and uh, drawing pictures and making mockups. And then smart people actually make these things real, which is a magnificent thing to behold. I'm honored just to be a part of it. And I'm having a lot of fun. And speaking of fun, when I'm not doing those things, I'm just playing with data that's in Living Atlas. Living Atlas is a little bit like Wikipedia for maps and data. And uh, people can uh, contribute their data if they want to make it more widely available to folks who can use it in their geographic information systems, either in the desktop or online. Um, and it's also where people who do mapping can find data that's made available by you know, federal governments or international agencies or even local governments or individual customers. Anybody who wants to share their data, it's available to them. And um, I goof around with that data and I make a lot of maps and I have a lot of fun. And if I make a map, invariably, I, I can't keep that to myself. I'm gonna share how I did it because I want other people to have the same sort of fun that I'm having. I just love it so much. And I write blogs detailing the steps on how I made something from data all the way through to layout and, and sharing. So. Um, that's really fun and really rewarding. And it can be a lot of typing, and a lot of screen capturing, and I'm lazy. And so over time, I've found that, you know, it's actually a little bit easier to just record demos and share them on YouTube and people can, people can see those videos themselves. Um, and so I have a YouTube channel called John Nelson Maps. And a lot of the times my blogs are uh, packaging up these videos and, and doing some outlining and, and showing some examples there. But feel free to check this out. A lot of it is um, cartographic shenanigans, goofing around, uh, ways of styling, ways of understanding data, the dimensions of spatial data, that sort of thing. And I just love it. I'm having so much fun with it. And when I'm not doing those things, you know, speaking of loving, I just love these people. I'm hanging out with these people. These are uh, my wonderful family. Um, and where do I work? I live and work in the United States in the great state of Michigan. Michigan is the one that's shaped like a mitten. It's shaped like your hand. If you look on a map of the United States, it's the one surrounded by water and it's shaped like a mitten. And we all use it as a waterproof customized map that we have in our pockets at all times. This is what my office looks like 11 months out of the year. And this is what it looks like about one month out of the year. I took this picture this morning. That's my daughter Sparrow picking some daylilies and eating them as fast as they grow. It's a lot of fun. So I would like to show you something. It's not often that I get to speak to a more generalist data visualization audience. So data people, uh, typically it's more specialists, cartographers, GIS analysts and, and geographers and that kind of thing. So this is kind of a treat for me. And as such, I like to um, I like to show people this. So I'm going to do a search here for NASA fires data. And I'm doing this live without a net. We'll see how it goes. NASA fires data. So NASA.gov has this great resource of uh, a, a set of satellites. So robots whizzing around the surface of our Earth, looking down at it, um, collecting all sorts of data in different wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. And some of those wavelengths are associated with fire events. And they collect those pulses of fire events and give those uh, freely via the internet. So a nerd like me can go to this website and say, oh, look at this. You know, I've just, I can download a text file of satellite data over the last uh, seven days covering the whole Earth. I'll just click this and it's done. It's a comma separated table here. It's a CSV. And if I open this up, it'll just open it by default in Microsoft Excel. You all are data people. So you're, 
you're probably not using Microsoft Excel, are you? Are you? I use I use Excel all the time, and uh, I know a lot of students use Excel um, or Sheets. This would also work in Google Sheets. So here we go. Let's take a look at this data. I'll, uh, Expand this content so we can see what we've got. We've got latitude and longitude, which is intriguing for a map nerd like me. Brightness, scan and track have to do with the orbital path characteristics of the satellites, you know, thinking in columns and rows and that sort of thing. What time was it acquired? Which satellite was it that did the detecting? You know, was it satellite A or satellite T because they're offset from each other? So there's never a gap in coverage as they kind of spin around the Earth. There's a partner satellite on the other side of the Earth collecting data. So the the lidless eye of NASA is always watching. How confident um, is the post-processed uh, value that that is actually a fire? Uh, and then something called FRP, which is interesting. FRP, I had to look this up. It's fire radiative power. And its units are in um, kajilowatts. I don't know what the units are. I forget what the units are. But a bigger number means more energy is being released at that location. So bigger fire, bigger number equals bigger fire. And was it day night? You know, was it daytime or was it nighttime? And let me just, does anybody ever use, uh, I mean, maybe you can uh, chat in Slido, I guess you're all muted. And so it's just me speaking into what feels like the void. But uh, sometimes I like to free myself from the tyranny of columns and rows, as they have been delivered to me. And I think, how can I mess with this data and pivot it here and there and get different perspectives of the same data? So I'm just going to grab all these columns and I'm going to insert a pivot table. A pivot table lets me slice and dice the same exact data in different ways. For example, I can take, a, let's see, um, I'll get which satellite did the recording. So was it satellite A or satellite T? And you can see that over here. There's two satellites. And then I can say, well, did they capture the fire during daytime or nighttime? And I'll drag this as the columns. It's the same data. I'm just repivoting it. And then I can take that fire radiative power, for example, and drag it here and just sum it up. And we look at this little table. And uh, this is a lot of fun for a map nerd like me and a general data nerd like me. But when I look at this, I don't intrinsically have a sense for less to more. Um, I can kind of get a sense that this is more, but really just because I can see more digits here, it looks like a bigger number, but that's not really an effective, intuitive, intrinsic way of understanding this data. So as a map person, I like to break out the crayons or crayons as we pronounce them here in Michigan, in the Midwest of the United States, we just we don't have time for two syllables when it comes to crayons. We just call them crayons, like cranberry. So I'm going to grab these four cells, and I'm going to color in. So I'm going to go to the Home tab, and I'll do what's called conditional formatting here. I would call it thematic mapping or choropleth. And I'll just say, boom, white to red, small to large. Now, immediately, my mind can look at this and intrinsically have a sense for more and less and everything in between. It's a wonderful way of understanding data very quickly, but we still have the benefit of the specific data that we can uh, more slowly and carefully interrogate, which is fun and interesting to me. So let's go back to this data. One day I was pivoting away uh, because it's just what I do for fun. Now I had to make a map and, or a chart for a map. And so I was doing a pivot table and I thought, you know, Latitude and longitude are pretty interesting. And uh, I'm a geographer and I think of latitude and longitude a lot. And I had an evil idea. I thought, what happens if I shorten this? So I'm going to do a formula here. I'm going to round this down to the nearest whole latitude and I'm going to give it zero decimal places. So instead of latitude 59.99204, it's latitude 60 degrees. Now, um, if you have a problem, Remembering the difference between latitude and longitude, or longitude, as I would say, uh, here's a tip. I don't have that problem anymore, because at one point, somebody taught me a trick. It is, latitude is like going up and down a ladder. Ladder, latitude, ladder, latitude, up and down the rungs of a ladder. Never had a problem with it after that. And then longitude is the other one. So let me flood fill this all the way down. And I just realized I don't have um, 
my compatriots here. I can't see your faces. So I wish I could like see like, John, stop talking. You're out of time. But uh, anyways, I'm just going to carry on. I'm going to carry on. And I'll call this lat. And then over here, I'm going to do a shortened version of longitude. Oops. Equals round. Parentheses. I'll choose my longitude field. Zero decimal places. Enter 150 degrees longitude. And I'll flood fill this all the way down. Now, how many fires are we talking about here? So this is over the past seven days. And we've got uh, about 100,000 fire events on the surface of the Earth, which is pretty interesting. And I'll call this long. So now I have a lat and a long. And if I grab these values, and I just grab that fire radiative power tube. Now when I insert pivot table, I'm going to enact an evil plan. So as a geographer, who sometimes goes up and down ladders. I know that latitude is the North Pole, which is 90 degrees to zero degrees at the equator to negative 90 degrees at the South Pole. North Pole 90 to negative 90 South Pole. And that's like, uh, those, those are rows, if I'm thinking in terms of a Cartesian coordinate system. Those are rows, so latitude, in my rows, and then I'll just reverse that sort because that's what we do with latitude because positive is at the top and negative is at the bottom. And then what's longitude? Longitude describes east-westiness, how far something is east or west. Uh, longitude describes left-rightiness, left-rightiness, left, 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 right, 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 right. And those are columns if we're thinking Cartesian in Cartesian space too. So let me just grab longitude and drop that into the columns area. And now I'm just going to grab fire radiative power and drop this into my values. And I'll grab everything and just make sure that these cells are roughly square because I'm fastidious like that. <clears throat> and I wonder if you start to recognize any pattern here. What the deuce are we looking at right now? When it comes to data visualization, we're always looking for structure. If we see randomness and noise, we keep looking, we keep slicing and dicing until we see a pattern, until the structure of the earth itself is revealed in our data. We just accidentally made a map of the earth in Microsoft Excel. And Microsoft Excel has no idea that it's just made a map of the earth. It becomes a map of the earth when we recognize it as a geographic representation and internalize that and have the wisdom to recognize that this is a spatial product. This is a geographic picture that's accidentally rendered in Microsoft Excel. Microsoft Excel is happy to provide this to me in rows and columns and aggregate numbers into cells. Let me just grab everything here and I'll come home and I'm gonna make these font size is pretty small. Um, and I'll make the background color black. So I'm going to start with like a black canvas because that looks cool. And looking cool counts. If your data visualization looks really cool, people will stop and they'll take a close second look. Good design is the currency that buys a closer second look. And that's valuable. It's not, uh, it's not something small. It's not something insignificant. Now, I'm going to do some conditional formatting here. Color scales. I'm going to go to more rules. I don't want two colors. I want 50% more colors than that. So I'm going to choose a three color scale. And the lowest uh, 10 percentile, I'll give like this cool, deep, cool blue. The middle 50 percentile, let's give it just fire red, no problem. And then the highest 10 percentile, or the, yeah, the 90th percentile up, I'll do yellow. So we get like this kind of flame gradient. This looks like the gradient of a flame that we would see. That's called natural mapping, not geographic mapping. But in design, the concept of natural mapping mimics the real world environment into an interface. And in this face, or in this example, these cells are an interface to the data. So this is a natural mapping color scheme. I'll hit OK. And now we've got a color-coded aggregation 
of global fires rendered in Microsoft Excel delivered to us via robots that are orbiting our planet right now, happily sending data down to nerds like me sitting in their usually snow-covered woodsheds in Michigan. What a time to be alive. I love it. I'm going to close this, and I'm not going to save it. Here's another uh, map rendered in Microsoft Excel. This one is showing global earthquakes over a 100-year period. So when we see this, are we looking at earthquakes? This is another interesting concept here. So this is made in Microsoft Excel. This is a pivot table, color-coded pivot table, aggregating global earthquakes. Now, you might start to see a pattern. You might uh, see some structure that's been revealed. Now, when I look at this, uh, understanding kind of washes over me, and I just can't believe the world that we live in. It's so wonderful. You have all these seemingly unconnected points of data, which in this case is earthquakes. But when viewed in aggregate, something happens called emergence. Emergence is when an underlying, more foundational structure reveals itself in the chaos and detritus of one order above it. What we're really looking at right here is the tectonic plates of the surface of the earth itself revealed itself revealed via you know thousands and thousands of earthquakes i just think that there's something magnificent about emergence when you can find it in big data here's another one this one shows tornadoes since 1950 in the united states that's uh there's me over here in that little hot spot of tornadoes that's great isn't that great so i'm showing you this why is this map guy just doing excel demos well i want to demystify things and explain some things. And the thing I want to say is geography is going to find a way. The planet that we live on uh, is our home. And the phenomena that we measure, the people that we are, is all based and rooted in the concept that we're sharing this planet. And so any data, even social science data that we see, if we map it in enough aggregate, we start to see reflections of the planet itself that we live on. Geography is going to be emergent and it will find a way. Um, another thing that I want to say is spatial is different. Uh, it's not just a number value. It's not just a Cartesian number. You've got the surface of the planet and everything is happening on the surface of this planet that we're measuring in earthbound maps anyway. So spatial is special. That's a kind of a cliche that we like to say in the map world. And I just said it out loud. I didn't think I was going to say that today, but I did. Spatial is different. And lastly, I want to say that software is not the boss of you. These are just tools to help get the ideas that are in our heads and um, the curiosity that's in our mind uh, out in front of other people. So that it lands in other people's minds, ultimately settling in their heart. And I think there's something wonderful about that. And um, as somebody who's not incredibly technical, I find some comfort in misusing tools to uh, perform things that they weren't designed for. I think it's great. And we do it all the time when we're kids. When we're little kids, we play with Lego and we don't follow the rules. We just assemble them. But over time, we follow the directions and then we get very regimented and you enter into Lego competitions and there's rules about what you can and cannot do. But it's always a good idea to breed a little bit of chaos and a little bit of R&D and a little bit of curiosity into our workflow instead of just being so busy all the time. That conveyor belt of work We'll never stop unless we steal some time to answer some of the questions that we have. This is an illegal move in the Lego building competitive environment. They call this an illegal move. And I say, illegal? Why? How else am I going to get my Star Wars TIE fighter wings on sideways without this illegal move? Why is there a perfect two millimeter gap between the studs and a perfect two millimeter height to the brick base? I ask you that question if it's so illegal. If you can do it, do it. Lastly, I want to show you this uh, this uh, visualization also rendered in Microsoft Excel. This is not showing you geographic data. This instead is showing you incidents of traffic collisions that involved pedestrians. And um, it's pivoted so that uh, the time of day is columns. So left, right is showing you the time of day. And up, down is showing you the season of the year, the month. And anytime we see a structure in our data visualization, we have to start asking questions of it. And there's an enormous 
cliff of risk that happens in um, the evening at dusk. And it's because there's a confluence of factors happening. More people are driving home and more people are out walking, enjoying the nice weather because they are home. And that combination of factors increases the likelihood of um, transportation related incidents for, for uh, pedestrians. But why does it bend? It bends because of seasonality, because our different number of hours of daylight. Yesterday was the summer solstice, the sunniest, most sun-drenched day of the year on our curved planet. And because we have a curved planet that has an axial tilt as we go around the sun, the data that's not geographic, which is purely human collected data of people and tragedies that's happening here, reflects the curve of the earth itself. This is not geographic data, but it is geographic data. Geographic data is underlying almost all the data that we work with. So I wanted to leave you with that thought. Uh, here's a little bit of contact information. Feel free to reach out. And I'm happy to have presented today. And I'm so glad my, uh, my computer worked this whole time.